There's not really a week that goes by that I'm not asked, so how do I get hired in pharma? And it's a good question because pharma look to people with a STEM background to take on some of the most technical, challenging and innovative roles within the industry. But that said, it can be difficult to break in without prior industry experience. So I thought I'd reach out to a recruitment professional with prior experience of hiring for the pharma industry to get an insider's perspective on what it takes to get hired in pharma. Hi, I'm Vicky Sherwood, author of the Biomed Badass blog and host of the YouTube channel where we discuss all things career related for STEM professionals working in academia and beyond. What you're going to learn about today is how to get hired in the pharma industry from the perspective of a recruiter who's worked for pharma clients in the past. I had the opportunity to interview Sam Bennett, a scientifically trained former recruiter for the pharma industry. Sam also has experience of recruiting for other life science industries, along with academia as well but more recently has set up his own business to work as a career coach and CV writer. I put it to Sam, so how can somebody who's looking to move from academia into the pharmaceutical industry put their best foot forward with their applications? So let's get started. The main thing that I would 100% recommend is look at your technical skills. Look at what you can provide for your potential employer. Because what I find is a lot of people in academia, they tend to focus on their publications, which is well and good, mm. but from an industrial point of view, they don't care. When I was in recruitment, the very first thing I would look at is your technical skills. What are you actually able to do? And then in what kind of environment? So those are the very first, if you haven't, if I don't see that within the first 10 seconds, off you go. So there are going to be certain things like GMP, GLP, good laboratory practices and GCP, good clinical mm -hmm. practices. Th those kind of things are going to stand out. So you need to make sure they're front and centre. Take a typical analytical chemistry role I would have worked on. So I would be looking for a HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography, mm -hmm. GC, gas chromatography and GMP, so good manufacturing practices. They were just the three things I was looking for. If they were, you know, if it was a little skills, you know, little skills column, you know, two little columns. And I saw HPLC, GC, and GMP, like, right, I want to read more. That's, that was my personal value of it. Just because you have HPLC, GC, and GMP, that piqued my interest, but it hasn't grabbed it yet. Where have you done it and who did you do it with? That's when I go looking for contacts. Um, so so the, the initial is the hook. And then I want to basically uh, find the end, the end of the line. The, the skills you're working on within academia are pretty similar mm. to the skills you've been working on, on in industry. The only difference is maybe application. One thing I've noticed, for example, is within academia, it might be a bit more precise and a bit more kind of a slower paced. Mm. Whereas in industry, it's a lot more high paced, but not as precise because you're working to stricter deadline. Typically, not always the case, but typically yeah. you would be. Traditionally speaking, within STEM, we tend to ignore soft skills. Mm. you know uh, they tend to tend to focus on you know can you use HPLC are yeah. you able to do a bio burden you know we don't tend to look at are you able to lead a team are you able to manage t uh, your mm. time um, so those type of skills can really set you apart from um, even an industrial candidate if you're working you know with a group of candidates you know some from academia some from an industry but the people from academia have really strong soft skills they can actually be long term more attractive than somebody who has the industrial skills but not the soft skills if you have done extracurricular things put them in you know mm -hmm. um, even if it is just a one liner um, because it comes back to what I was saying before soft skills are king the, the industry just STEM in general is moving so fast we need people who are adaptable who are able to learn new technology methods and, and mm -hmm. everything else so those soft skills are what are going to set you apart treat your PhD as a job working there for four years you have developed skills treat it as a job because I was working with a couple of people this week actually they had just finished their PhD and they were looking to transition into industry they almost had this the equivalent much of experience as somebody who's got two years industrial experience surprised how often people don't do their CVs in reverse chronological order. If you have a long career history, you know, whether you're a contractor or you've been in the industry for years, don't go back more than five years. Once you're beyond five years, it's not really relevant. Have it there, you know, as a one-liner, 
you know, to show that you've obviously been doing stuff, mm -hmm. keep it short and concise because when you recruit and you're looking at 20 odd CVs for a role, you don't have time. I think one page is better. I think realistically, and this is across the board, you know, if you have less than three or four years experience, which includes PhDs, don't have that much experience, you know, and that might come to a bit of a shock to some people. Again, I was working a couple of CVs, you know, just last week, you know, they were all, you know, masters and PhD graduates and they were all kind of hitting the two page mark. I'd recommend if you just graduated, one page should be enough. And even, and I think I, I, I mentioned this earlier, but even if you have like, you know, 20 years experience, you know, you only want to go back about five years, which is, should still quite conceivably get on two pages, but generally speaking, simple as best. The way I approach cover letters whenever I'm helping someone write them, it's almost like your CV but as a story. When you're writing a cover letter, you, you have more of a chance to inject your personality into it. Definitely take out the key element. You want to tailor each cover letter to, to each job, obviously. But you know, you, you want to take out the technical skills. You know, I am a PhD in cancer biology and I work with cell mammalian cultures. You're hitting those keywords straight away, but you're mm -hmm. giving the story behind it. The reason why I'm interested in it is because of X, Y, and Z. And because of X, Y, and Z, I went down to A, B, C. So you're giving yeah. the recruiter the, the, uh, the story behind everything. It very much depends, you know, so I, I'm only going to speak about farmers specifically in this yeah. case. There are definitely others worth looking at, especially in IT, um, but I wouldn't have enough personal knowledge to say mm -hmm. what's best and what's not. But within pharma, there was one particular certification that if I ever saw on a CV, I was like, I want that person. Lean Six Sigma. I don't know if you or your viewers are familiar with it, but I'll just quickly run through. So it's broken down into three categories, yellow belt, green belt and black belt. So yellow it's pretty basic. The whole idea is that you're, you're learning to make things more efficient. You're just trying to essentially make it more lean. Green is obviously just a step up above that. So green, mm -hmm. is, it's very good. It's very good in, in its own right. And I would still get excited about it. But this is when you start investing more time into it. And usually you need your company to help you out with this. You can't just do it by yourself. And black is just, you know, is king. A black belt in, in Lean Six Sigma was amazing, especially for engineering. And then of course, you know, there, there, are, lo there are loads of other different things get along the way you know like uh, if you want to want to become a QE qualified person obviously you have to go on and do, do that in a formal degree you can't just you know decide one day I want to become a qualified person there's loads of different things within STEM and pharma specifically um, that you do need to ferret out and I'd recommend reaching out to a recruiter if you have a specific goal or something you want to work towards find out what do recruiters who recruit for those people get excited by you know exactly what's worth your time and what's not because I'm sure there's plenty of stuff out there that might look good on paper but recruiters don't really gear towards. One thing I used to always recommend to people um, who had just graduated or were looking to change, you know, um, fields or, or what have you, was to be very proactive and actually call companies they wanted to work for. So, you know, get on the phone, talk to, the, you know, the internal talent acquisition managers or whoever they are and just try and get interviewed by talking. It's daunting, you know, but, you know, that's what I used to do for a living. Um, so it definitely can be done. But, you know, it is scary. But, you know, you're really putting yourself out doing, doing something like that and that really sticks out. And if you, if you get somebody on the phone, you know, and they're thinking, you know, I really like the sound of this person, they'll at least come and meet you. And it might just be for 15 minutes over coffee. And it might only be for a six month contract, but that's your, that's your toe in the door. And then once you have your industrial experience, you know, the world is your oyster. But what I would always recommend is, you know, kind of start, start like with a funnel. So you want to start off with like 50 companies and then just keep going down, 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 and then you will get somewhere. These are human beings you're calling, you know, they, they have the same hopes and aspirations, you know, that you have, and they probably were where you were, where you are now. So just think of them as human beings, and it becomes a lot easier just to talk to people. Because what you're looking to do, you're, you're not looking to get a job right there on the spot. What you're doing is you're looking to make a connection, make a human connection. Um, once you've made that human connection, it's much easier to facilitate your move into industry. Even in the last two or three years, just uh, there is more of an emphasis on being able to communicate. I think I need to explain at this point what a passive a candidate and an active candidate is. So a passive candidate is somebody who's not looking for work right there and then. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they may be open to opportunities, but they're usually working, doing what, you know, living their life, whatever, where they're mm-hmm. kind of, as you can imagine, mm-hmm. is somebody who's actively looking for work. Generally speaking, the best people are already working. So I would obviously have to go out and coach them, you know, from wherever. I have. In terms of grads, to bring it all back, just now you do need that those internships, you know, you do need um, mm-hmm. those contract roles. They do help you stick out. I can see where clients are coming from, though. It does cost time mm. and money to train someone up. And I think we've touched on this in previous conversations in that what universities need to start thinking about is how to partner up with industrial company as part of a course. You know, you actually go on site for, you know, six, maybe three months for four years, you know, so part of your course. And then by the time you're finished, you have a year, year and a half worth of industrial experience, you know what it's like in there. And I think what it also does is it kind of confirms or reaffirms, you know, your conviction whether or not you do want to stay in academia. It just gives you that sense of direction. People reach out to me all the time, more than happy to see how I can help people. I'm quite hands-on in how I help people. I like sitting there, you know, talking and uh, going with them. I, I'm not guaranteeing I can help everyone, but I'll at least be able to point you in the direction of where you need to go. I think the main thing that I offer that a lot of people have been interested in is interview prep. So this is me sitting down with you and walking you through all the different scenarios, of, uh, all the different uh, interviews that I prepared my own canvas for, you know, that they've gotten jobs from. As uh, intelligent as scientists can be, we can be quite repetitive. Mm-hmm. Um, so st- interviews tend to follow a format. Um, you know, so what I do is I coach people through those. And what I find is a lot of people, they make their mistakes with me and um, they, they tend, they always come back after and say, you know, your interview was so much harder than the one I went for. I also do a lot of LinkedIn work as well, you know, so if you have a LinkedIn profile and not mm-hmm. quite too sure how to optimize it, I give you a hand with that too. So the first thing I would do is definitely their CV. A lot of the people I've worked with, I, I need to almost coach them to change their mindset a little bit. So focus away from publications and look more at your technical skills. Grow thick skin. There's going to be a lot of rejection before you get that yes. Don't take it personally. You know, unfortunately, that is how it is right now. And uh, that, that would be the next thing. And the third thing is take it easy as well. You know, don't burn yourself out. Make a plan. Take control of what you can control and uh, then just execute it you know uh, yeah. um, we, we've all been trained you know to uh, to take tackle things on quite logically and analytically do that but then you know be sure to take breaks from you know your job as well okay Samuel, thank you so much for sharing all your tips and advice and as we said before i'll put all the links to where people can find you um and your services in the description below thanks a thank lot you very Sam. Much. Cheers. thank you very much for your time thank you So Sam covered a lot of super helpful information there and also raised some important points that can help you get hired in pharma. The first is to do with your resume or industrial CV. Focus on your skills up front in the CV, your technical skills and soft skills. But keep it short and to the point, one page is best. Secondly, cover letters. You should aim to tell the story behind your application in your cover letter so that the recruiter can see your motivation for applying for that particular job. Number three, professional development and gaining certificates. It's useful to check with recruiters which certificates are important for specific roles within the industry. Don't be afraid to reach out to recruiters and ask this question. They're a great source for identifying which type of certificates resonate with hiring managers and recruiters within the pharma industry. Number four, networking. Be proactive and call companies. It takes courage to take those steps, but it can pay off in the end if you're able to leave a lasting impression and build important connections. And lastly, number five, look after yourself. Treat yourself well during the job search process. You'll undoubtedly face rejection along the way, but don't get disheartened and take regular breaks. You'll get there in the end. If you've enjoyed this content and you want to learn more about some of the things you can do to help you secure a job after your current academic position, while still positively affecting your research work, then head over to my site. I've got a free download that can help you with this and offers some great suggestions for you to prepare for a job in industry after your current academic position.